So you wanna buy a vintage motorcycle. This is Brendan here with Common Motor, common-motor.com. We're gonna go over all the key points of information you need to know when looking at a used vintage motorcycle for sale, how we evaluate it, and how that information is gonna help you find the bike you want for your next project. Stay tuned. So you wanna buy a vintage motorcycle. It's definitely a question that we get a lot here at Common Motor and uh, other vintage bike owners get similar questions for folks who are interested in getting into the whole vintage bike thing. And we're gonna give you five key points to consider and look at to help evaluate the bike and know the scope of the project that you are potentially about to get into. So coming back to expectations, there's a few things to keep in mind before you even go and look at a potential project motorcycle for sale. Number one is know your budget. What are you willing to spend on this bike? And then what are you going to be willing to spend on all the parts and pieces needed to get it up and going again? It might be more than you think. Two, keep in mind that most of these bikes are around 50 years old, plus or minus a few years. But granted, you don't know where this bike's history has been, how many hands it's passed through, what's happened to it along its life. So it's kind of an unknown factor. Third is what we call the laundry list. And we're going to have a link to that article down below here in the description. And what the laundry list is, is regardless of the condition of a bike, whether it's in rough shape or in actually very good original shape, there's still a bunch of things that have to be done to the bike in order to make it safe and road ready to ride around. The very first key point is, does the bike have a title? Because a bike without a title is actually just parts assembled in the shape of a motorcycle. And if you're able to get a title, if it's missing, you know, you're gonna have to budget about 300 bucks for it um, in paperwork just to get the bike legal again. So a title is definitely a big key point on uh, what the status, legal status of this bike is. So not only does it have a title, one, but two, do the numbers on the title match the numbers on the frame? Sometimes there's a discrepancy there. Sometimes it's not the right title for that bike. You never know. So you definitely have to check the numbers on the paper versus what's stamped in the head tube of the frame. The other one is, is the person whose name is on the title also signed the back of the title as a seller. Just remember that the person who's on the title may not be the person who's actually slung the bike. There's sometimes there's a, a little bit of a gap there. So that's something you gotta keep in mind uh, when you're looking at a, a an old bike is, does it have a title? And do all those things line up? Because without a title, it can start getting expensive very quickly. So the second key point we're gonna look at is the engine of the bike, which is kind of the heart of, of any motorcycle, the engine. A lot of folks are worried about a bike running or not. That's not such a big concern when you're talking about a vintage bike. Um, what I'm more concerned about is, one, is the engine stuck or not? I mean, does the engine rotate? If the engine rotates and turns, that tells me I have a good chance that the engine is gonna run just fine once we get things fixed up. Now there's more than just the fact that the engine is stuck or not. There's a few other details that I wanna pay attention to as I am turning the engine over. In this case, I'll be using a Kickstarter um, to, to determine these factors. Uh, one is, do I have a, any resistance on the Kickstarter? Is it smooth resistance? Well, that's good. That tells me that the engine probably has compression and it's gonna be able to run. Or does the Kickstarter just kind of flop to the ground? There's no resistance there. That says something's going on inside the engine that may not be uh, engaged properly. Nothing that could be catastrophic, but you might have to dive in and, and figure out what's going on. It is possible when you're turning the engine over, you feel something kind of weird, something that's clunking or clanking or feels kind of crunchy, something not correct as the engine is turning. So those are all things to, to keep in mind when you are checking an engine out just by turning the Kickstarter. A few other things to be looking at on the engine is the physical condition of the engine. You know, does it have any broken parts off of it, missing case covers, big cracks or scrapes in the aluminum sides of the engine? Uh, was the bike dropped? Things like that. Is it leaking oil? Is there a big puddle underneath it? Again, not this, not this stuff is necessarily catastrophic, but it means it's gonna need attention. It's one more thing to add to your list. I'm also gonna be looking at the odometer 
on the bike. Now, typically on the vintage Hondas like we support, we see mileage in the range of about 2,000 to 8,000 miles on average, even though the bikes are 50 years old, because bikes aren't ridden that much. If I saw like a Honda 350 and it had 25,000 miles on the clock, it tells me, wow, this bike was ridden a lot, one, and two, I probably gonna have to tear inside the engine and do an inspection to make sure everything is in good shape because the service life on the engines is a lot more frequent than you would think of in a car. So bike miles and car miles are kind of completely different entities from one each other. The third point we're gonna look at is gonna be the completeness of the bike. Are all the parts there or what parts are missing? Uh, more commonly or not, the, a lot of vintage bikes are, don't have all the parts there and you might be on a hunt for certain parts that are easy to find or very difficult to find. There's a big handful of commonly missing parts on a lot of vintage bikes. Uh, things like tank, seat, side covers, uh, fenders, tail lights, turn signals, gauges, carburetors, mufflers, air boxes. These are all parts that tend to get taken off the bike and never make it back on if someone was trying to work on it. Now it's possible that your bike has a lot of these parts on it, but there's a question of are they the original parts for the bike or are they aftermarket parts for the bike? And there's a lot of common aftermarket parts that people throw on bikes that are not original. Things like mufflers, handlebars, uh, seats, lights, parts like that, or they've been swapped over the years and so the bike might look complete and whole, but actually those parts have been swapped. Some of them are a big deal, some of them cause problems. It is possible that the bike is missing so many parts that it's just now a parts bike versus a project bike. Meaning that it's not worth trying to fix up and make into a complete motorcycle. You're gonna use this bike just for pieces to fix up another bike. The fourth key point we're talking about is the physical condition of the parts that are there. And we're gonna divide that into two different categories. First is easy to replace parts, or parts that I'm not really worried about, or you shouldn't be worried about because they're easy to replace. The second one is the opposite. Parts that are difficult to replace and or expensive to replace, and if they're missing off the bike, could get costly. The following parts are the parts that I'm really not worried about or you shouldn't be concerned about with the bike because they're probably gonna get changed anyway, again, or they are easy or inexpensive to replace. Uh, things like the tires, chain, rear shocks, handlebars, turn signals, headlight. These are all really easy to swap parts and many of those should be swapped anyway because you get the bike up and running and you shouldn't use the old parts, especially for safety reasons. Now in contrast, we have the difficult to replace parts. So we got things that are like the tank and the seat, which are definitely key points of the bike. They can be expensive to try to find ones in better shape or to get fixed up and repair them back to usable condition. Uh, mufflers are a big one. Sometimes they're cheap and easy to do. Other times, like on this CL, scrambler pipes, they're kind of pricey to find some ones that are in good shape. Uh, gauges, that's another one that people tend to ignore. Uh, upper triple trees, especially on the Hanas that are notoriously cracked. Uh, fork tubes that are overly rusty. Same thing with rims on the bike. These all are pieces that if you don't have them or they're not in good shape, well, it's gonna be some either a lot of elbow grease to get them fixed, or you're gonna to have to track down some other parts to replace them with on the bike. You have to ask yourself the question with some of the, uh, the parts is, if they have some physical damage to them, but they're still usable, can you live with them on your bike? Now, some people don't care about his aesthetics as much as others, right? But the question is, is this part usable versus cosmetically pleasing? Uh, you could have a tank with a big dent in it, but it doesn't leak. Are you gonna run that or not? Your choice, right? So those are the questions you have to ask yourself of what, do you, or what are you willing to deal with on the bike cosmetically? This brings us to our fifth and final point of uh, our bike evaluation, which has to do with a surface finish or the surface condition of the various elements of the bike. And this can be broken down into a couple different categories based on uh, the material and the finishes that are there. One of the big ones we're gonna look at is chrome. Vintage bikes have a lot of chrome pieces on it. I like this, uh, like this uh, fender guard, or sorry, this muffler guard right here, that tend to get rusty. Now, depending on the rust, sometimes it's very easy to clean off. Other times, it's so pitted and bad that the part is kind of like cosmetically not gonna look great. So again, you have to ask yourself, what am I willing to deal with 
when it comes to chrome pieces. Second is going to be painted surfaces. This is mostly going to be things like the tank and side covers the bike. Uh, oftentimes the frames are also painted. They're painted black and usually that's easy to deal with, but definitely the, uh, the surface finish of things like the tank. Speaking of the tank, since it tends to be the very big focal point of most bikes, not only is the outside finish of the tank what condition it's in, but the inside, you know, under the gas cap here, you know, what's it looking like inside? On this case, this one's pretty crusty and rusty on the inside. While you're looking at the tank, you might find that it's actually, instead of being rusty and gross on the inside, that it's already been coated by a previous owner. Now this could be good or it could be bad, depending on what type of coating was done and how well it was executed in the coating process. So uh, you just don't know until you're actually looking at the tank. Uh, the final thing we're gonna look at is the aluminum of the engine. Now typically this stuff isn't painted or it's at least partially painted. So if it's exposed aluminum, oftentimes it's uh, corroded and you'll get this white uh, kind of flaky dust on everything here. And depending on how dirty it is, it can dictate you know, how long you're going to spend time-wise cleaning all these pieces up just to remove uh, that oxidation and make this thing look uh, super clean. So keep that in mind, how, how much uh, cleanup time do you want to put into all of this? I hope this, uh, these key points here in going over uh, how to buy uh, your vintage motorcycle are, is helpful to all you out there in setting expectations for the nature of the project you're getting into as well as setting budgetary uh, constraints as well because we know that's the real reality of actually dealing with a project like this. As always, this is Brendan here with Common Motor, common-motor.com on the internet. Make sure you follow us on Facebook and Instagram, subscribe to our newsletter via our website, and of course, right here, subscribe to our YouTube channel down below, ring the bell, and we'll see you next time.